while a lot of Europe is going about its day like normal, coffee shops opening, buses running, tourists pointing cameras at postcard views, something ancient and intensely alive is unfolding right now on the slopes of Mount Etna. It starts the way many of Etna's most consequential episodes begin, not with a dramatic boom you can hear from the coast, but with a quiet signal that only instruments notice first. High above Sicily, satellites are sweeping over the volcano in their regular passes, and in the thermal bands the mountain suddenly looks wrong. Not wrong like a glitch. Wrong like a living body running a fever in one very specific place. A cluster of heat anomalies is sharpening into a clear pattern on Etna's eastern flank. The signature isn't diffuse. It's not a vague warm patch. It's concentrated, line-like, and growing. And that detail matters, because it suggests a fissure, an opening in the ground, rather than a single vent. Down on the volcano, nothing looks particularly alarming at first. A lot of people near the base see only cloud and haze, draped over the upper slopes. Etna has a way of hiding its most important moves behind weather. The eastern flank is especially good at that. Moisture rolling in from the Ionian Sea. Dense cloud banks snagging on the mountain's shoulders. Visibility collapsing to a blank white curtain. From the villages below, Milo, Fornazzo, and the scattered hamlets tucked into orchards and terraced lava soils, there's no clear show yet. No towering ash column. No fireworks fountain visible from someone's balcony. But in the data, it's already happening. As fresh imagery arrives, high-resolution frames from modern Earth-observing satellites, volcanologists begin to see what the clouds are hiding. A new eruptive fissure has opened at high altitude, roughly around the 2,100-meter level, in the broad, scarred wilderness of Etna's eastern depression. And from that fissure, incandescent lava is pouring out, bright enough in thermal imagery to look like a wound of pure heat cut into dark rock. Within hours, the flow organizes itself. What begins as scattered glowing points along the crack becomes something more legible, lava channeling into the terrain's natural grooves, gathering into arms, splitting around obstacles, then rejoining, always following gravity's patient logic. It is spectacular, but it's also oddly quiet in the way only effusive eruptions can be. This is not primarily an explosion, it's a release a pressure valve opening on the side of a very large machine. One of the first moments when the situation clicks into focus is when specialists start comparing the location to Etna's own memory, because Etna doesn't just erupt anywhere at random. Over long timescales, it repeats itself. The mountain has preferred paths, structural weaknesses, and buried corridors where magma finds it easier to rise. And this activity is showing up near one of those historically loaded zones the area around Monte Simone, an old advent of cone tied to eruptions centuries back. That's the kind of detail that makes professionals go still for a second, because it's like watching an old fault line in a story reopen. It doesn't guarantee escalation. But it does suggest that the plumbing beneath this flank is doing what it has done before. Reusing old routes, reactivating old fractures, exploiting the same deep architecture. Now, here's the part that always grabs people emotionally, the visuals from below. From certain viewpoints on Etna's eastern side, the lava appears uncomfortably close to inhabited areas. It's a trick of perspective. Glowing flow lines draped across the mountain can look like they're pressing right up against villages, like the orange edge is just beyond the next ridge, almost at someone's doorstep. The effect is similar to the way a full moon seems enormous when it hangs low over the e horizon. Those images spread fast, because they are dramatic, and because humans are wired to measure danger by what looks close. But the topography is doing something important here. Etna's eastern flank includes a massive natural containment feature, the Valle del Bove, a huge uninhabited depression, steep-walled, broad, and empty. It's a geological amphitheater carved by collapse and reshaped by countless flows. The valley's scale is hard to grasp until you see it from the air. Kilometers wide, with walls that expose stacked layers of old lava-like pages in a history book. And right now, that valley is functioning the way it has so many times before. 
as a natural channel and buffer. Instead of spreading freely in all directions, the lava is being guided, confined by the terrain into a route that trends downslope through the volcanic desert rather than directly into towns. The flow advances, yes, but it advances inside a landscape that was built for exactly this kind of event, barren, rugged, and largely unoccupied. If you're watching the updates as they come in, the numbers are the anchor that cuts through the drama. The active front is down from the fissure, having lost hundreds of meters in elevation as it descends. The path isn't a straight line. It curves with the ground, meandering around rocky promontories, sometimes narrowing into channels, sometimes widening into lobes. Measurements of length can change as the lava finds new micro-roots, and the flow field can expand in complex ways. One arm stalling while another surges, a new breakout appearing, then cooling into place. And this is exactly why satellite monitoring is so powerful in a moment like this. The same imagery that looks beautiful on social media is, for scientists, a set of measurements. Thermal intensity gives clues about which parts are actively moving versus crusting over. Repeated passes allow mapping of advance rates. Visible band imagery shows the geometry of the flow field and any changes in vent distribution along the fissure. Because the fissure isn't just one hole, it's a fracture, a line of multiple vents, each behaving slightly differently. Some points along it feed stronger, more sustained streams. Others pulse or weaken. Together they build a lava field that evolves almost like a living thing. Branching, thickening, cooling, cracking, then being overrun by fresh, hotter material. On the ground, the experience, when visibility opens, can be surreal. Imagine standing far below, where cultivated land ends and the mountain becomes raw. You see the upper slope glowing in segments, like strips of molten metal laid across black rock. The lava moves slowly in human terms, but it's relentless. It folds over itself, forms crust, then breaks that crust from below. It emits a dull radiance that turns clouds from white to bruised orange. At night, it's not just light, it's a presence. And yet the volcano's deeper signals, the seismic tremor, the broader pattern of unrest, can remain within ranges that indicate an effusive episode rather than the onset of something far more explosive. That distinction matters for public safety messaging. Effusive lava flows can be incredibly destructive to infrastructure if they reach it, but they are usually less immediately life-threatening than sudden, ash-rich explosive phases. Provided people respect exclusion zones and do not approach active fronts or vents, the real danger for curious onlookers is often not the lava itself, but the environment around it. Unstable ground, hidden fractures, toxic gases in low spots, sudden collapses of crust, and the simple fact that terrain on Etna is rough even on a good day. Add heat and poor visibility, and it becomes unforgiving. This is also the moment when Etna's repeat behavior becomes the story behind the story. Why here? Why this flank? Why this line? Because magma behaves like any fluid under pressure. It seeks the easiest route. If a region of the crust has been fractured before, if an old dike once forced its way upward, that zone can remain a weakness, a scar that never fully heals. Over decades and centuries, stress fields shift, pathways clog, new cracks form, but the mountain often returns to the same neighborhoods. Monte Simone and its surroundings aren't just scenery. They are evidence of a long-running structural template etched into the volcano. And now, that template is active again. Right now, what makes this episode feel so compelling is the contrast. On one hand, a contained, channelized lava flow inside a natural basin. On the other, the raw immediacy of watching Earth's interior spill out onto the surface. It's easy to reduce that to spectacle, rivers of fire, but the more profound reality is quieter and more unsettling. This is the planet doing what it does, on its own schedule, indifferent to calendars and celebrations and human attention. For the K, K 
communities around Aetna, the priority is steady, accurate information. Updates grounded in measurement rather than rumor. That means regular mapping of the flow field, constant checks on seismic and deformation data, and clear communication about what is and isn't threatened. It means respecting that Aetna can change tempo quickly, but also acknowledging when the situation is stable enough to avoid unnecessary alarm. And on the mountain, the lava keeps moving, bright at its core, darkening at its edges, writing a new layer onto an old landscape. The Valle del Bove, that vast empty scar on Etna's flank, is once again doing its job, absorbing the eruption's energy, guiding the flow into a place where it can unfold with fewer immediate consequences for the people living just beyond the rim.